Thank you so much for staying with us. Concerns remain about the performance of states, more because people live in the states, so there are indigents in the states, and the federal government only has citizens who live as indigents in different states of the federation. So the performance of state governments, particularly the state government the governors, is something that readily comes to mind, especially when you consider what really does or should a state bring to the table when we talk about national development. Every month, Nigerians get the news that states will share the fact every month. And then the natural question is, okay, so where is all that they share coming from? That's a different conversation altogether. But what's important at this morning, uh, as at this time, is how the states contribute to national development and how you can raise questions where need be. Help me welcome this morning, Dr. Austin Tam George. He is a former commissioner for information in River State. He's also a former senior executive fellow at Harvard Business School. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, sir. Always good to be here. It's interesting, you know, uh, when we talk about development, uh, earlier uh, Professor uh, Olusule was uh, talking to us about certain progressions over the years, particularly in the area of uh, development and agriculture, economic focus and all. Perhaps you want to begin by giving us an idea, because many Nigerians wonder exactly what is the Nigerian identity when it comes to its economy. What would you say that is? I'm not talking about historically. Historically, we'll probably put it in the docket of agriculture. And over time, we've seen how that has been eroded by petroleum. And so, and we are still also struggling with, are we also as interested in technology, in fintechs, and all those things? What is the Nigerian economic identity as at this time? Uh, can you hazard a guess? Yes, I mean, we still have um, oil and gas as... Um the mainstay, you know, provided the mainstay of the economy. Um, over 80% of our uh, GDP is still based on the um, derivatives from oil and gas revenue. Uh, but you know, there is a whole um, debate now across the world concerning the emergence of renewable energy and the, uh, you know, the transition away from fossil fuels um, to renewable in energy. So what this means is that we need to um, here in Nigeria, rethink you know what the economic base of our country should be. Um, I believe that the most important resource that a country has is not oil and gas or or, or or lithium. You know, our most important resource is our own people. Um, Nigeria has um, a very young population. I, I, in fact, they say um, over 60 million of um, over 60 percent of our population is below the age of 19. So Nigeria is a very young population. Now, what this means um, is that we have the advantage of youth. What we therefore require is a very strategic investment in human capital development. And um, in Nigeria, you know, education is on the concurrent list, meaning that the federal government can play in the sector, the state governors can also play in the sector. So what I think we should do, um, if you really want to diversify our economy and bring sustainability um, in terms of the growth of this uh, country, we need to have a very strategic and massive investment in human capital development. We have the population, we have the enthusiasm, we have the dynamism of youth. So what is lacking now is a very strategic vision that says how can we invest in human capital development so that we can move forward as a country. Interesting that you raised that quite, I think about two or three times we've raised an issue that's occurred on the front page of the Nigerian Tribune this morning. Many times we talk about out of school children. Uh, Kayla, every time she's on air, she doesn't shy away from reminding us of that particular number. Now it seems we have a case of out of school teachers. Mm. Two, almost 200,000, 194,000 plus uh, teachers, according to UBEC. That's the shortfall of teachers in the primary schools. In fact, that report goes further to say that in some, school in, in some schools in the rural areas, we have, they have not more than two or three teachers in the rural areas. And I'm wondering, so when you talk about human capital development, do you think we're really interested? 
Well, we have to be interested because, as Do I said, Do you think we are interested? When we we, it, it remains to be seen. We need, we need um, if we, when we have a shortfall um, of teachers who are the drivers of, of, uh, of, of um, the knowledge sector, I think we need to have strategic investment in, in, in staff recruitment. Um, we need to make sure we completely rethink the remuneration system, even in our educational system. Who, who, who should, my apologies, who should be bailing that cart? The state governors and the, and, you know, as I said, you know, we, education is on the concurrent list. Now, the concurrent list of the constitution says the federal government can set the tone, but the state governors also have a role to play, which is why every state has a ministry of education. So what that means is that you can't domesticate your educational policy per state and say this is the kind of emphasis we want to place now in terms of human capital development, in terms of how we are going to recruit our staff, in terms of how we are going to remunerate our staff, how much we are going to pay. The state governors are completely at liberty to do this. So you don't have to wait for the federal government to say, look, this is the number of people you know you want to recruit. The state government can actually decide. There are state institutions. If you go to any state now, there are probably state universities in virtually every state in the country. The state government takes direct fiscal responsibility in the, in the running of these places. So they can recruit staff. I know that in River State some some uh, years ago, about 10 years ago, and the Rotimi Amici administration recruited at one time, recruited up to, um, up to 11,000 um, teachers, you know, so that, that tells you that state governors can play a lot of role in that. So if you really want to prioritize education, human capital development, you can actually invest massively in this sector and turn things around. But there's another point um, I would like to raise uh, concerning the kind of emphasis that we want to see in education. We've seen that even when people leave the universities or any kind of center of learning, they tend to have difficulties in creating jobs. In fact, you know that unemployment is a major crisis in this country. Uh, but how do you resolve that kind of problem when people are leaving the, all these centers of learning, technical schools, um, you know, universities and polytechnics, and they are barely able to find jobs? I think that we need to move away from credentialism and certification to actually place an emphasis on you know skill acquisition so that one, once people are able to leave some of these places of learning they're able to not only get jobs but be you know be able to create jobs you know uh, for, for for others so i think that this is a time when if you want to tackle unemployment the kind of unemployment crisis that we have we need to ask what better can we do to re-inject skill acquisition as a central focus in our educational system you know it's curious that you say that once before, I looked at the NYSC, I don't know whether it's the NYSC Act or guidelines or whatever, some document about the NYSC. One of the most critical objectives of the NYSC is skill acquisition, entrepreneurship. So even if you escaped it at the primary school level, you escaped it at the secondary school level, you escaped it at the university, at the NYSC, you shouldn't. That is one of the core responsibilities of the National Youth Service Corps. Is that, do you see any semblance of that in any way? Man, we we need to systematize it. Let, let me give you an example um, Ayok, concerning how important human resource development is. And as I said in my introduction, it is more important than simply getting um, natural resources. Let me give you the example of Taiwan. You know, in Nigeria, we have oil and gas and the rest of them as natural resources. But in Taiwan, do you know what they have? They have only earthquakes, typhoons. They don't have the natural resources that we have in Nigeria. In fact, in Taiwan, if they want to build houses, if they want to go into construction, they import gravel and sand from China for construction work. That's how very challenging their topography is. But you know what they did? They invested strategically in human technical development. So China, Taiwan is just a country of about three, 23 million people, but they have the fourth largest foreign reserves in the world. They are the leaders in the manufacturing of, of semiconductors, also known as microchips. The US depends on Taiwan 
for 70% of his microchips uh, needs. They are the leaders in the sector. You know, so it, this is what technical education investment can do. So mm. it's not so much the kind of natural resources that you have, as much as whether you have the technical ability to drive change. In Nigeria, we've had the oil and gas sector since 1958, when we went commercially in, in this sector. But we still don't have the extensive technical manpower that is required to do turnaround maintenance. So what that tells us is that we, at this point, you know, in the 21st century, we should be moving away from simple um, credentialism and certification to say, how can we build human capital development that is skills-based? It goes back to the question that I asked you first. Mm. If you were to put Nigeria in a docket of identity, what would it be? You just cited the example of Taiwan, mm. and you've argued my case. Mm. And the same thing goes for China. I mean, when you're talking about certain infrastructural development, you're looking at China. You talk about technology, you're looking at certain countries for that. You, you, you talk about you know, the United States of America, a picture comes to mind. You talk about the Britain, some kind of picture comes to your mind. What picture comes to mind or should come to mind? What's the potential Nigeria has to say, okay, this is what, when you're looking for this particular thing, this is it. Just as you said about Taiwan, mm. microchips, what is it about Nigeria? What, what's the potential that all states, all policies should feed into? It should feed into human capital development. That is not the case now. That's precisely what I just said. Okay. That is not the case now. In fact, we need to, when we used to have energy dependence, you know, a, a energy sovereignty, let's call it that. You know, we had gas, we were not importing um, oil, we were the ones who, who you know that that's uh, you know exported oil to different parts of the world so you could say that there was a time that we had very significant en energy sovereignty but that is not even the case now you know we still import uh, petrol even if we are an, an oil producing country so even where we used to have competitive advantage we are ceding that advantage now to other parts of the world. So what I think is that, you know, as state governors and the president begin to reset the economy, they should ask the kind of question you are asking now. How can we be more competitive in the global economy? How can we make sure that we move with the times by moving away from resource economy to a manpower-based economy? So, mm -hmm. but these are not, you know, decisions that can be made, you know, by just one governor. There has mm -hmm. to be a strategic investment in human capital development to say in the next 10, 15, 20 years, this is what we want to do to make Nigeria or any part of Nigeria emerge, you know, as the center for human capital development in this. They did it in Brazil. I mean, in Brazil, what they did in the beginning was to say, how can we make sure we strategize in terms of investment in fintech? And today, if you want to do anything about fintech and the rest of them, you go to Sao Paulo. How can we do that in Nigeria, where if you want to invest, if you want to talk about aviation in terms of uh, technical manpower in aviation, pilot training and the rest of them, can we go to Aquaibon State, for instance, where the aviation dominance of Aquaibon State is now beginning to emerge with um, um, a bomb air. They have a state fleet, you know, for a bomb air, so they can leverage on that by saying, look, how can we also uh, move, broaden our participation in this sector by investing in um, all kinds of workers within the aviation um, subsector? Can we invest in pilot training? Can we invest in um, cargo um, deployment and repairs? How can we make sure we specialize in certain skills areas? I think we need to rethink our manpower base mm. and say we can invest in all of these things. Uh, as I keep saying, our investment should be in human capital development mm. rather than worry so much about, about natural resources. Because in the final analysis, even the natural resources will have to be refined and to and the refinement of natural resources requires extensive manpower skills mm -hmm. do we have the skills to do that as i speak with you we need to make that decision um, in in developing human manpower well i know my colleagues in abuja will want to get in uh, before they do and i also know we we'll want to talk about your state river state but how, how do you what do you think about these other arguments some people are bringing up about regional um, economies. Uh, I, I, I can't forget this kind of map, uh, you know, that 
Dr. Lickel that came up with years ago, mm -hmm. saying that okay, if this particular region, South South, is good for this or can be good for this, the Northeast can be good for this. We can scale up the capacity of the midwest of, uh, of northern the northern region, the Northwest or North Central in this particular area. Southwest has this capacity. Do you see that as something that the states? can sit collaboratively, collaboratively to, to do, or that the regions themselves will come together and say, let's champion this? You know, regional uh, integration, let's call it, you know, is a very good, it's always a good, a, um, a good um, um, economic strategy. Uh, but in each region, um, IO, uh, the way this country is, is configured now, in each region, we have states. Mm. And each state is led by a governor. Now, before you talk about regional integration, there has to be the question of leadership that has to be resolved. You see, in the South-South, I, I can't speak for other regions, but in the South-South, um, there's what is called the BRICS, you know, um, an acronym for all the states in the South-South. Now, for you to have the kind of regional integration that will benefit over 30 million people, you know, in that region, you need leadership. Leadership that says, how can we think beyond the borders of each state to see how we can better integrate mm. so that somebody takes a railway system, they develop a regional railway system, for instance, I, or where somebody in Port Harcourt, um, a farmer in Port Harcourt can leave the farm in the morning or around seven, around seven o'clock. And by, by, by 7.30 or by nine o'clock, that farmer in River State is already in, in, in the market in Asaba or in the market in Benin, you know, trading. And by noon, they are by noon or two o'clock, in the afternoon, they're already back to Port Harcourt. To make that kind of regional integration in terms of commerce to happen, there has to be leadership. So far, so far, you know, we haven't seen that kind of leadership at the level of the states, not to talk of at the level of mm. the region. So regional integration is always a good idea. It happens in the U.S., it happens, as I said, in Brazil. But for it to happen here, we need to elevate our quality of leadership per state mm. for them to have a regional vision. That hasn't happened. It hasn't crystallized yet. Interesting. Interestingly, we understand that the federal government has a seven-hour road uh, project from Lagos to Calabar. Uh, Nigerians are certainly looking forward to that. As I said, my colleagues are waiting for you. Go ahead, Nilta. Oh, well, I, uh, Kayla was going to go first. <laughs> Look, it's fine. <laughs> Ladies first, Ayo. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Austin, you know, it's interesting that you're talking a lot about states. Uh, I'm going to start off with something that's happening in the FCT right now. We're actually seeing that breaking here. Even though the FCT is not a state, uh, uh, the President Balatinibu has approved the federal capital territory's over 1.1 trillion Naira statutory budget for the 2024 fiscal year. That's actually uh, being said right now by the FCT minister during uh, this uh, media party that he has going on. But that uh, ties us to my question. And it has to do with the FCT minister the state governor in River State, and the state assembly. This impasse uh, between these three parties, there has been attempts to broker some kind of peace, some kind of agreement. The president waded into the matter, but we're still seeing all of this going on. Could you talk to us a bit about the situation on ground in River State, where you used to be uh, commissioner for information? This situation in River State, and how, in your view, it could negatively or maybe positively impact governance in the state. Well, you know, I try not to double into politics since I'm not one, but I think the, the facts are quite clear. Um, there is no litigation concerning the governor's status as a governor. He's already been certified, um, elected by the Supreme Court, so he has an unquestioned mandate, you know, to roll out his agenda for the benefit of, of, of over 7 million people of, of River State. Um, there is some, co some um, controversy and understand there are quite a number of cases in court concerning the legitimacy, if not the legality of the um, State Assembly members. Uh, I understand they defected uh, from their previous party to a new party. Um, and, the, and I think the laws are quite clear um, concerning those who, who defect um, um, in, in that manner. So until their, their, their legality is re-established through the, litig the various litigations now underway, um, some people, there's a very prepon uh, preponderant feeling in River State that um, 
those who have defected from the from their parties um, have automatically lost uh, their seats. So there, there is a serious legal question that is underway um, as far as those uh, mem uh, members of the assembly are, are concerned. You, you asked, um, and the other segment of your question deals with um, the FCT minister. I think I've made that point earlier when I was here in one of the shows, that the FCT minister's mandate is now very strictly limited to his office and responsibilities in Abuja. He has no business inter interfering, not alone, let alone meddling in the affairs of River State. River State has a legal and legitimate government. Um, I think we should give them the time and space to rule out the agenda so that um, they can move the state in a different direction. Actually, what we were trying to get from you was the impact uh, all of this would have on governance in the state as we're talking about, you know, what states are bringing to the table and how they are going to bring their people out of poverty, managing the economic situation in their states. The, the, the state, what the state governor should do um, is just to keep the focus on his promises. Um, I've seen his budget. I think um, um, social... Um, the, the budget provision for uh, fiscal year 2024 for River State um, says um, he's budgeting two, um, 128 billion naira, I think, for social uh, development. Uh, social development means investing in, in, in people, in, in lifting communities out of poverty. That's a massive amount of money, uh, meaning that a lot of work has to be done in the social sector. I encourage the governor to go about it without distractions. Um, you know, there is also an investment in education that I've seen uh, from the budget. Um, the, the budget for education is, I think, 40 billion naira for fiscal year 2024. That is 57% higher than previous budgets that I've seen in the state. And that's a very commendable emphasis. And I think that the governor has very clear um, objectives and he should just avoid distractions and go straight to fulfill uh, what the objectives are. As I said, we have 7 uh, million people in River State or so. People are doing business and there is now an appetite to reinvest and bring back businesses in River State. I think the government should be focused on those very important people-oriented um, objectives rather than worry about, about politics. My own attitude to public office is that once elections are over, uh, the government is now officially in a social contract with the people um, in order to rule out objectives and try to change the material conditions of the people. Um, and I think that should be, be the focus of the, of, the, of the government because in the final analysis, nobody is going to judge the governor based on his fights uh, with his uh, predecessor. They are going to judge him and his administration on the basis of what positive impact uh, they were able to, to make with this historic opportunity to serve the state. So I think he should focus on his objectives and uh, allow the distractions for, for another time. Uh, Dr. Tom George, indeed, uh, good advice for the governor. But let's look at some other governors. Um, I uh, sitting with you there many times when he's talking, he'll tell you that the failure of security across the country is a failure of the local government um, level of government. Um, now, one of the states in the north central region, the governor had a conversation with um, caretaker committee chairman in the state of the critical committees of local government and was telling them that he's willing to implement full autonomy. The law, the constitution of Nigeria, talks about the powers that the local government have. And many of the things that the state governors are even handling right now are, ought to have been handled by the local government. Is it a question of party politics or inability to read through the constitution and understand what the local governments are doing, are supposed to do, that the governors are not allowing them or seemingly not allowing this, the local governments to function as they should. Okay, Neotra, this is a very important constitutional and administrative question because the local government is actually um, a different tier of government with its own financial allo allocations. Um, I remember that those days in the 80s when there, there were so many you know, agitations for the creation of local governments, the main argument was that local governments were the closest 
you know, tear of government to the people and therefore they needed to be created so that the more local governments that we are created, the closer and closer um, government was supposed to be driven to, to the doorsteps of the people. Ironically, in 2024, you know, we are still talking about government being distant from the people because local government administrations are not allowed uh, by state governors to have um, autonomy. I think that there is already an autonomy. It is the implementation of that autonomy to the effect of actually making impact um, on the ground that is that is that is missing. Um, the irony uh, in Yota is that while the state governors are asking for more and more powers from the central government, they seem to have less appetite to cede more powers to local governments that exist within the, within the state. So what I think is that we should have very strong local government administrations. Whatever uh, financial allocations are due to the local government should be sent to the local governments so that they can you know, execute developmental projects that are directly impactful to the the people but that doesn't always um, answer the, the, the that's not the, the, the entire question um, in Yota. We still need to have structures of accountability even at the level of local governments. I can tell you as somebody who has been in government myself that allocating resources do not automatically does not automatically mean that the, those resources even when they get to the local governments uh, will be will be uh, you know judiciously used. So I think that across the board what we need is not just the autonomy but the corresponding structures of transparency and accountability in the deployment of state resources, whether it is at the federal government level, at the state level, or at the local government level. So autonomy, you know, at the theoretical level, constitutionally, is fine. But how do we make sure we build those structures of accountability so that people can see exactly how much has gone to the local governments and how judiciously those amounts have been spent. I worry that we do not yet have those structures of accountability that are effective to hold uh, some of these public officials to account at all levels of government. So where do we go from there? How do we set up those parameters to, for of accountability? There are, there are two ways you know, we can do this. The, the first is to make sure we strengthen the local councillors because at the local government level, the councillors are the lawmakers. You know, they are the ones who will hold the chair, the chairpersons to account to say, look, we have a budget. How much have you spent? How can we verify these projects? Is there an auditing process? All of that. You know, we need to strengthen those structures. But I know we know better than to to allow politicians to hold themselves to account. So you know, it's like expecting landlords, you know, to hold a meeting to reduce rent. It's not going to happen very soon. So what you can do is to say, how can we activate social? Uh, I mean, civil society organizations. How can we set up civic groups? You know, um, NGOs that are interested in public transparency and accountability to infiltrate the space of governance by saying that, look, in addition to whatever oversight responsibilities that might be exercised, you know, by councillors, we as civil society groups, as citizens of this local government or the state, also want to know. Uh, through a very transparent process, activating um, the freedom of information mechanism to say we want to know how much has, has been collected from the states in the case of local governments or how much has been collected from the federal government in the case of states to say we want to track this amount of money. How has it gone to this sector? How has it uh, been able to impact the people? How can we do a social impact assessment of government policy and all that? So what I think is that maybe we need to broaden our understanding of how democracy works. Unfortunately, we tend to think that democracy only means that every four years we vote, but that's not the case. We actually need to be awake immediately after the election to make sure that we are involved in a very participatory and interlocking process of engagement with public mm -hmm. officials in order to get accountability happen. But how about the people? I mean, I know that this, if civil society they are part, they are Nigerians, mm. a good number of them are Nigerians. Mm. Even the politicians themselves are Nigerians. Mm. But a situation where on the social media, which has literally democratized or deregulated, so to speak, the mm. media space one way or the other, of course, people always know where to authenticate the information that they get on social media. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to engage with the people using these new technologies, new media technologies, 
all across in a way that even the government itself can communicate with the people and sift feedback from them mm. so that they know where the headspace of the people are and the people know where their headspace is. This is a very interesting question, you know, because it reminds me of my time in government. As Commissioner for Information, I set up the first social media unit of the Ministry of Information because when I went there, you know, there was no department for social, uh, for social media. And I felt that today with the emergence of new technologies, um, citizenship itself has been redefined People are, you know, geographically disaggregated, and yet they are interested in what happens in a particular location. For instance, there might be investors outside of River State who do not necessarily live in River State, but are interested in what is happening in River State. The only way you can reach them uh, in a way that beats both geography and time is to make sure there is an active social media engagement protocol. And I, I established that. And I think this is something that a lot of state governments and local governments you know, can, can establish to okay. say, look, how can we use you know, new technologies to open the space for, for participation? But the point you raised about how more and more people can get involved in the governance process is very important. How can we make sure that the, we raise civic consciousness. In Nigeria, people are so desperately poor that they think that accountability and transparency have abstract concepts because they are more interested in the next meal, they are more interested in house rent, they are more interested in school fees. You know, so we need to elevate the social consciousness of our people to understand that, look, even poverty is a social condition. Satan plays no role in that. And a lot of these things, poverty and wealth, are direct products of government policy sometimes and individual entrepreneurship, of course. So we need Need to make sure that people get involved and not fall back. Once the government is constituted, the government, the people themselves should be part of the process of governance by asking questions, setting up civic groups, litigating, getting more information, asking mm. questions and demanding answers. That is the only way we can hold public officials to account and become more participatory in the process that governs our system. Ultimately, the, uh, the objective is for a better developed Nigeria. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Dr. Austin Tam George is former commissioner for information in River State is also a former executive, senior executive fellow at Harvard Business School. Thank you so much again for your Thank time you, this I morning. And well, that's our show today. Thank you so much for the privilege of being a part of your morning. I'm Ayo Makinde. Do have a wonderful first day of work in this April. A wonderful day. And also a very, very wonderful day to all of you uh, who are joining us here in the Abuja studios. Thank you all so much for tuning in. It's a very special day for us in Abuja, isn't mm. it? Yeah, a couple we, of our people have yes, to stay Malpe. Well, we have, we have Malpe's birthday today, Larry Lassisi's birthday today as well. So we're leaving you so we can go party. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Some of us have work too. <laughs> and work has resumed. The holiday is over. Thank you for letting us be a part of your morning. Go be the best you can be. And it's a new quarter. Let's make the best of this new quarter. Nail tiger. I'm Kayla Magua. Enjoy the rest of the day.